Welcome to Chromaticus. Today we're going to break down the main motif from Morning Mood, which is the first movement of the Piergin Suite by Edvard Grieg. If you're not familiar with the orchestral piece, you probably are familiar with the melody because it's been in every Saturday morning cartoon. When the character wakes up in the morning and there's that random flute melody playing from outside the window, that is Morning Mood. It's sad that it's been reduced to the alarm clock song because the actual orchestral piece is quite brilliant. Let's start out by listening to the first eight bars, which is the initial melody and then the first repeat. And pay careful attention to the changes in textures and tone colors. The first time he plays the melody, it's in a solo flute, and the accompaniment is in woodwinds. On the repeat of the melody, it's in solo oboe, and the accompaniment is in the string sections. As always, we are in score in C. The tempo marking Allegretto is light and cheerful, and Pastorale is music of the shepherds, or shepherdly. This is usually an instrumental movement in 6-8 or 12-8 time, often with a long bass drone or a pedal tone. This section of the piece has two textures, it's melody plus harmony. So there's a solo flute playing the melody that's not a very strong, powerful instrument. So the harmony down below is sort of bare bones because you don't want to overpower the flute. The melody plays in E major and the harmony is an E major chord, the one chord, and a six chord, which is C sharp minor, which is also a tonic chord. So the entire four of our phrase is over tonic chords. So it's a very static, very simple harmony, which means that the melody is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. These grace notes here and here add a lot of really nice expressive qualities to that melody. It's really easy to get caught up in the practice of writing one or two new chords in every single bar of your music, especially if you're a new composer and you're studying lots of jazz theory. I know myself, I fell victim to that mentality when I was a student. Every song I wrote had like 9,000 chord changes and they made no sense at all. Something that I've learned from studying orchestral music is that you should never be afraid to keep the harmony very simple and sometimes very static and be more expressive and creative in the other aspects of the music, such as the melody, the rhythm, or the orchestration. Initially, we have an E major triad played in the bassoons and the clarinet, and it's orchestrated in what we call a juxtaposition. That's like instruments that are grouped together in their expected registers. So the bottom half of the chord is played in the bassoons, and the upper part is played in the clarinets. Towards the end of the phrase, he has this little dynamic marking, so it's a crescendo and then a decrescendo. And notice that the harmony also crescendos along with the melody, but he also adds a solo horn and the other flute to join in the harmony during that kind of crescendo. And that's what's called an orchestrated crescendo, where you're adding instruments as you're getting louder, and then an orchestrated decrescendo would be taking instruments away, rather than only using dynamic markings to increase the amplitude. There are three really important things to learn just from this right here. The first thing is that when you're extending woodwind chords down in the low register, it's really common to use the horns. This is because French horns are considered the bridge between the brass and the woodwind family because of how well they blend. The second thing is that in order to get the best blend of that nasal quality of the bassoons and that soft mellow quality of the French horns, he uses what's called an enclosure, meaning he puts the one horn in between the two bassoons. And lastly, notice this little eighth note tie over the bar line. When you're orchestrating a decrescendo, you might not always want the note to drop out before the downbeat of the next measure. So an eighth note tie over the bar line creates a very smooth, seamless transition. Notice as the melody is coming to an end, there is a little tag of the melody down in the violas. The melody ends on a quarter note followed by an eighth note rest. So this is pretty static right here. So that tag two octaves down in the viola adds a nice bit of interest at the very end of the phrase, and it helps to pull us into the harmony in the next repeat. The first repeat of the melody is played by a solo oboe. Both oboe players read on the same staff here, so A1 means just one player is playing. If he just repeated the melody again in the flute the same way, it would start to get pretty boring and repetitive. So the melody has moved down one octave, so he's changed registers, and every register sort of has their own sonic qualities to them. He's also gone from solo flute to solo oboe, so the tone color has changed dramatically. 
the double reed instrument having that nice nasal biting quality to it. Whereas the flute has that very uh, fluid kind of silvery quality to it. So that change of tone color and change of instrument is really important. And the harmonic accompaniment that was in the woodwinds is now in the strings. Notice each section is playing divisi. That means half the players are playing one note and half the players are playing the other note. If you had all the string sections playing one note at a time, you would only have four notes to the chord. So that divisi helps them break up so that they can play that full chord. This time at the end of the phrase, he takes the three chord, which would have been a G sharp minor chord, and he alters it to a G sharp major chord. This is a chromatic alteration of the three chord. That's why we have the B sharp and the A sharp here. This particular alteration of the three chord most of the time will sound like a new one chord, depending on how it's treated. In this particular case, Grieg does choose to make this the new one chord, as we'll see in the very next section. What's so fascinating about this is that he uses that E as a common tone in the new key. So instead of just modulating up a third to G sharp major, he modulates to G sharp harmonic major. That flat six degree adding a very exotic sound to the melody and the harmony. This is what makes the modulation much more exciting for the listener, and it's a great way to get a lot of mileage out of the same idea. Let's listen to bars nine through 20. Other than the key change, not a whole lot changes for the first two repeats. The flute plays the melody the way it did the first time. The harmony in the clarinet and the bassoons is the same, with the addition of the horn and the flute towards the end of the phrase. The only real difference in the harmony is that because of that E natural, the sixth chord is now on the flat sixth degree and it's an augmented triad. Otherwise, all the orchestration and everything is the same. And notice the ties over the bar line to the little eighth notes, just to keep that nice smooth, fluid transition from the harmony being in the string sections to the harmony being in the woodwinds. The next repeat, same thing, melody in the oboe and harmony in the strings. In bar 16, just like he did the first time where he modulated to G sharp harmonic major, in this case, he's modulated up to B major. So the harmony plays a B major chord and the melody reflects that change with the B natural. Notice that in the original key of E major, in the scale E major, you have E, G sharp and B. So his modulations went from E to G sharp to B. So he's chosen to modulate to places that have a very logical relationship with the original key and give a very smooth connection between the changes. So they're not very abrupt modulations. They're not to very distant keys that would give a really dark sound because that's not what he's going for. Bar 17 is where things start to change as he's building an intensity towards the climax. Fragmenting an idea is something that helps build intensity and tension. So he plays one bar of the melody in the flute with the accompaniment in the woodwinds. But then in the next bar, he switches to the oboe for bar two of the four bar phrase and the string accompaniment changes as well. In bar 19, he starts to make smaller or rather faster fragments, which helps build tension even more. So he has half a bar of the flute melody with the woodwind accompaniment half a bar of the oboe melody with the string accompaniment. And then in bar 20, as he's really building and trying to swell that sound going into the climax, he's still fragmenting that idea melodically, but the accompaniment is in the strings for the whole bar, and it's also joined by the woodwinds. So now we have a larger, louder harmonic texture. He also adds in the other flute as it's building. Also in bar 20, he adds the timpani, playing a tremolo. Those three slashes through the stem is an unmeasured tremolo, so they're just playing back and forth really, really fast, combined with the crescendo, and then the horns come in at the end. Using timpani and brass like this, swelling into a climax is very, very common. It's one of the things that they're best at. Also notice that as the strings 
and the woodwinds join in with those horns on the second half of that last measure. That melodic fragment, he doubles in octaves in the oboe. That helps make sure that that melodic little fragment is still standing out above the harmonic background. Because as you're building in the harmony, you don't want to wash out the melody. And in the last measure, before we get to the climax, which is in the key of E major, starting on a nice big E major chord, he adds in the note A, making it a B dominant seven chord instead of just a B major triad. This has a much nicer effect resolving into the next measure. I want you to hear how this building of texture swells into the climax. So let's start again in bar 17. We'll listen to the fragmented ideas again, and then we'll go right into the next section and listen all the way through. In measure 21, we've arrived back in E major for a recapitulation of the original theme. But this time, the melody is in full string sections in three different octaves. The contrabass also comes in playing the bass notes. Too much low end bass all the time kind of diminishes its power and gets kind of dragging. So Grieg held off until now, so that way the effect of the bass coming in is much more profound. The harmony is now in the entire woodwind section, and the horns are used to fill out that harmony, because as we know, they are the bridge between the brass and the woodwinds. Notice that the horns also are interlocked with the bassoons, which helps non-reed instruments blend with that biting quality of the double reed bassoons. One bassoon playing that low E, the B being played by the horn, the next note E being played by the other bassoon, and then above that you have this horn playing the G sharp, a repeat of that B, and then this horn is playing E, which is actually overlapping with the lowest note of the clarinet. So it's interlocking with the bassoons, but then overlapping with the clarinets. This is what helps the horns blend in so well with the woodwinds. The rest of the woodwind section is playing the E triad in two octaves. So you have the clarinets playing the first two notes, then the two oboes, and then the two flutes. So they're all playing in their like registers, and they're just doubling the triad in two octaves. A lot of beginner composers think that you have to always put the melody above the harmony, but as you can see here, the harmony in the woodwinds is throughout the entire treble clef, but it still sounds like a nice background texture. It doesn't overpower the melody because it's in such a large part of the orchestra. Violins one, two, violas, and the cellos all playing the melody in different octaves really helps to make that stand out nice and up front. So the harmony playing throughout the same registers isn't washing out the melody. And notice the timpani hit on the downbeat of that measure after the swell from the previous measure. So that melody repeats just as you would expect it to. The little tag at the end is now in bassoons in octaves, as well as contra bass. As you expand the harmony to larger sections of the orchestra, and you then need to expand the melody to larger sections, and you also need to expand the counter melodies to larger sections. That way things don't get washed out and everything remains balanced. And notice that the bassoons were playing these static notes along with the rest of the woodwind harmony. So they come out right here just to play that little tag and then they go back into static notes of the harmony. This is a really useful technique in the orchestra. It's taking certain instruments and sort of changing their role, even if it's just for like half a bar at the very end of a phrase to highlight some melodic idea. In bar 25, he has another repeat of the melody, but then he does something really fascinating. He repeats the melody for only these two bars, but in bars 27, instead of just finishing the melody like he did the first time, he takes this little three note fragment and he starts to sequence it upwards a couple of times through this measure here. And you can also see it in the bass line moving up in steps. And this ascending motion is something that naturally creates tension and builds intensity. And you can really feel it when you listen to it. If you're using modulations or sequences in your music and you do it too many times in a row, it can start to take on a very comical effect. 
This is great for film scoring if you're writing for a comedy, but if you're not going for laughter in your music, it's best not to overdo the modulations or the sequences. Pio means more, so this is more forte or more loud. I think the reason for doing this is that he didn't want it to be the fortissimo coming up. He wanted it to just be like somewhere in the middle of those two. So just a little bit louder than the forte that they were playing from here, but not quite as loud as the fortissimo coming up. In measure 30, he starts this sort of flourishing idea of a G sharp major chord. The dynamics get louder to fortissimo. There's accent markings over all of the notes on the downbeat. He also adds in a trumpet, and it's a very nice full sounding chord. Now notice that this flourishing idea is really just an arpeggiation of a G sharp major chord. The three string sections just playing arpeggios of that G sharp major chord. Also notice the downward moving melodic direction, whereas before we had that upward moving direction sort of building tension. Now he's moving downwards to sort of release that tension give us sort of a calming sensation and counteract that previous build of tension. Also the harmony as it's decrescendoing, he also uses an orchestrated decrescendo. You notice the trumpets and the entire woodwind section, they finish up right here on this downbeat. But the horns continue on a little bit further right here, and then the cellos and the contrabass go even further. So he's sort of pairing back the instruments rather than having them all stop at the same time. So these last two bars really sound a lot more complex than they really are. It's a very creative way of playing a chord. I like to end my orchestration episodes with a quote. I'm not sure of the source of this one, but it goes like this. If someone tells you you can't, they're showing you their limits and not yours. Remember that the only limits you have are the ones you set for yourself. So go break the rules. There are no rules. Just write something really adventurous and wacky. I bet you'll have a lot of fun doing so. That concludes today's episode. Thanks for watching. And remember to keep studying, keep practicing, and keep growing. See you next time.